We're back with another episode of Why Wasn't It Better? I am your host, Patrick Darms. And I'm your co-host, Anton Paras. And joining us today on this another episode of our second season is our friend, Nathan Perry. Nathan, welcome. Thanks, guys. Glad to be here. Welcome. Friend of the show, Nathan. Welcome. It's uh, excited. You should be excited because we're oh. here to talk about <laughs> your choice that you wanted to cover for this week's episode, which yeah, is Death Note. This was all me. Let's this is all let's you. Just <laughs> be very clear. It was all me. Before Absolutely. we get into things, is there anything, Nathan, that you'd like to plug or promote while you're here? Uh, not today. No, just uh, excited to be here, guys, and just I'm happy to uh, be having this conversation about this just incredible film. Excellent Great. choice of words. So just the good. So just plug in the good word of the Death Note. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just just a shout out to Kira. <laughs> you know, I'm a Kira enjoyer. Something like that. Just jot that down real quick in the note. Uh, Before we actually get to the discussion of this week's movie, uh, just a reminder to our listeners, our YouTube channel is uh, full speed ahead. If you want to check out our our episodes in full that we post there, as well as a, 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 a number of shorts that we've been creating out of little snippets from the full length episodes. So check that out. It's been getting plenty of views and plenty of follows. So we appreciate all those who are participating in said following. Did anyone see the new Mission Impossible? Because we did cover the first one last week. Not yet. I, I'm, I'm probably going to watch it later this week. But Patrick, when you told me how long the film was, I definitely hesitated I for a sec. I know. Oh, how long is it? 245. 245. Yeah, yeah, that's such a fast movie. Two minutes and 45 seconds. What kind of film is that? <laughs> How is could it, they even charge money? <laughs> is it at least, you know, uh, uh, hopefully it's not too, it keeps it keeps a good clip, I hope. I mean, Mission Impossible should have stunts, stuff like that. Oh, I don't know. I didn't see it. Oh, okay. Sorry if I led you on there. Oh, yeah. I, uh, it's all right. I'll... I was I was very close to doing it, and it was on a Saturday. And I looked at the runtime. I was I was on the Fandango app, about to purchase the ticket, and I looked at the runtime, and I was like, "Ooh, I got some stuff to take care of today. I don't think I can make that work." I I did see a film though. I watched a different film on Friday. Went to the theaters. It was a bit of a double feature in that we watched a film at home, Uncle Buck on Netflix. Shouts out to Uncle Buck, John and Candy. then. Yep. Shouts out John Candy. Rest in peace. And then we went to the theaters and watched Elemental. That's the Pixar movie, right? Right. Which after watching it and looking more at its reception, we've talked about Pixar films already, but that would be a fun current one to review. But I'll say we'll save that discussion for later. Okay. Yeah, we can put that on the list if you think it would be worthy. Oh, yeah. It's just... It was it was, it was fun, and it really I it really did have me asking why didn't this movie do better at the box office? This was a really good movie. Hmm. I'm sure I'll check it out when it appears on Disney Plus in a couple months. Right, give it about a week. <laughs> <laughs> Which may uh, unfortunately be how a lot of people treat a lot of movies these days. I'll just wait for it to show up on Disney Plus. I mean. I've certainly been guilty of that a lot, so I can't understand. It might happen with me with um, the new Mission Impossible, although I do want to see it. And then, of course, Oppenheimer comes out this week, oh. which I'm really excited not, for. Not only that, but Barbie as well. Yeah. Right, right. You're going to pull a Barbieheimer, as, as the kids are saying? It's two very big films. I'm, I'm very excited. It's been a great summer for movies. Uh, yeah, I, ha, yes, I would agree with that. Yeah, we had Indiana Jones. <laughs> we had uh, Super Mario yeah, earlier this year. Um, that that might be all I can think of, which I'm a little embarrassed about. But hey, whatever. I think we had a Trolls movie. Uh, did we? <laughs> I don't know. I'll take your. But word hey, you it. know that's not our that's not our specialty. Knowing what films are out in theaters right now. Come on. <laughs> oh no, yeah, this just isn't a movie podcast or anything. <laughs> But why don't we start diving into the film for today? Absolutely. Just so the listeners have some clarification, we are in no way, shape, or form talking about 
the beloved anime Death Note that came out about what was that two thousand six seven? Right. We're Maybe talking even about a little bit earlier. Sorry. Oh yeah, I think you're right. It might have been a little bit earlier because I only only because in researching about this, like the Japanese live action one was two thousand six. Oh, oh wow! Right. It yeah, it might have so been like oh four oh five. Re- the manga released in two thousand three. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Wow. History. We are, of course, talking about the 2017 Netflix adaptation of this. And we we planned actually to review this film because uh, since the manga released in 2003, we're also celebrating the 20th anniversary of Death Note. Good call out. Yeah. And what other what other representation to think of for of that beloved series than this than this 2017 American adaptation? <laughs> Well, if we can read between the lines, uh, Patrick, can you walk us through the plot of this film? Absolutely. So Light Turner is a high school student who discovers a supernatural notebook that has deadly powers. Guided by a mysterious Shinigami, Light can kill anyone he wishes simply by inscribing their name within its pages. Intoxicated with his new power, he begins to eliminate those he deems unworthy of life igniting a global manhunt in the process. Death Note was released on August 25th, 2017 by Netflix, LP Entertainment, Vertigo Entertainment, Lynn Pictures, and Ryuk Productions, LLC. Huh? Directed by Adam Wingard. What was that? Hot to Ryuk Productions. What, what was it? it? It's clearly like they came up with like, what should we name the LLC? Let's just name it after the guy from the manga. This is clearly some kind of shell corporation, allegedly. Yeah. Yeah. So it was directed by Adam Wingard. Screenplay by Charles Parla Pan- Panitis. I'm going to have to edit the hell out of yep. this. Vlas yep. Parla Panitis and Jeremy Slater, based on the anime of the same name. Starring Nat Wolf, Lakeith Stanfield, Margaret Qualey, Shea Wiggum, Paul Nakauchi. <laughs> Jason Lyles and Willem Dafoe, a budget of $40 million and a box office return of nothing because it was on Netflix. (laughs) So Nathan, why have you chosen this movie for this week's episode? Well, when Anton first started uh, reaching out about this podcast and talking uh, with me, um, you know, he, he, I think Anton, you led with like, Oh yeah, we could come up with some like movie ideas. Or something oh, yeah. like that, like like come up with something, and um, definitely as I, I will I will confess, not a, not in full seriousness, I threw out Death Note as an example. Don't know why it came to mind, just was was there, you know, one for a little bit of a laugh, but also because I think you know you uh, why wasn't it better as a as a subject is something that you ask a lot about when you adapt something, right? I don't, I mean, like. Why wasn't why weren't all those video game adaptations better, right? Why weren't all those adapting other media better? And sitting on it, I was like, well, anime is popular. People want to adapt it and get it out to a broader audience, right? You know, everyone, you know, in 2017 was like picking up anime and stuff like that. And this was just an interesting one that sit in the middle of, I think of some other adaptations that were kind of happening at the same time. And I just thought it was kind of, it was a weird one. It's a weird one. That's kind of been in my brain for years since I watched it. Well, I think it's an inspired choice. And when Anton told me that you had selected this one, I was kind of overjoyed. (laughs) I mean, you know, I'm, it seems like, safe to say all three of us here are, are anime fans. You know, this is not the type of movie that I would think casual viewers wouldn't watch. They might watch it inadvertently without realizing hmm. it's an anime right. adaptation. Right. right. I, I see but, what you're saying. You, you have to be an intellectual to be in the know. Well, <laughs> um, hmm. basically, yes. Right. I mean, like a- a- anime in the U.S. is a lot like soccer. It's very popular, but it's it feels very niche at the same time. It is one of those things where there's really, I don't know, other than something like very general, like Dragon Ball Z, there was like no one ever told you like, oh, yeah, there was that one summer I was really into anime. You either you either like it or you don't. You know what I mean? And Death Note is not just any anime, right? It's one of the most highly rated 
manga slash animes like of this century. The yeah. original manga sold over 30 million copies, which is one of the best selling manga of all time. Mm-hmm. And then the 37 episode anime adaptation released in, uh, I don't, I guess I had the dates wrong. It was earlier than 2006. 2006 was probably when I saw it, but mm-hmm. that was equally successful. And that's what became popular with Western audiences. Like a lot of people that I know have seen this and love it. It just has such a high reputation. If you're an anime fan at all, there's an excellent chance that you've seen this and like this. I'll even add on to that. I think one of the interesting things of, and we can get into it on why this movie was even made, is that I think Death Note is is one of those few series that people will say, I don't really like anime. Oh, but I really like Death Note. Yep. It definitely transcends that for sure. It, right? it's, like, it's so the, famous that even even casuals have usually heard and it. There's a few there's a few reasons that we could look at historically as to why. And I feel like that's why particularly this film's like accessible for a lot of our listeners and whether or not they're anime fans is because they've probably heard of Death Note. And I did want to I did want to clarify the 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 anime did release in 2006. So you were right there, Patrick. Okay. Mm-hmm. The manga released in 2000, 2003. So that was when the concept was released. And that's interesting that they had the live action movie then. I have mentioned the Japanese one only because I remember actually seeing that movie in theaters, like in the US. Like that was a movie that uh, someone dragged me to in high school. <laughs> like a friend was like, let's go watch this because I don't even think I'd ever seen the anime at that point. He was just like, oh, I really like this. Let's go watch it. Dang, that's a good, that's what you call a good friend. (laughs) Definitely. So it's a, it's a, it's two parts, right? The Japanese live action. Yes. Right. right. Well, (laughs) yes, it is two parts. Um, and, and has even other follow-up movies as I was not even aware of until I was looking into this one for this podcast. I wasn't either. They have a spinoff movie that came from it and even a like a sequel we'll say that isn't that is like a complete original idea yeah i didn't even realize that yeah Yeah. and that's yeah that's where also we can get into maybe why this movie came out i don't know i have a theory there but let's save that for later i loved the anime when i saw it i i probably saw it around 2007 or 2008 when it was this Mm. would have been very early netflix streaming where i actually saw it and i I think I binged the whole thing in like two or three days. So good. Yeah, it's 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 definitely one of my favorite anime of all time. It's such a unique premise. The character mm-hmm. it's some of the best <laughs> complex character development I've ever seen in an anime. And that's something anime does well in general, but this does it better than most. It also and the plot of course, is just so cool. No. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Um I was gonna say one of the I think one of the reasons it has an enduring a legacy and breaks into I would say Western audiences a little bit more is despite some supernatural and quote I'm finger quoting like anime stuff I mean it a big part of it is it's like a Sherlock Holmes detective it's brainy a, yeah. cerebral story yeah. it's not a it's not a Dragon Ball Z it's not like we're not powering up for episodes no it's this kind of logical thing that attracts a lot of people to it right are you are you telling me this is psych with death gods <laughs> <laughs> i know what you're saying though and i completely agree it, it's it has so much supernatural stuff in it but it's not any type of a fantasy right it's something that very much yeah. is supposed to exist in the real world mm-hmm. you know and and even the- when those elements are there and sorry anton no go ahead uh, even when those elements are there it's it's often like very practical, right? It's adding a new rule or something like that. It's usually not like, oh, we introduced something fantastical or magical. And it's like, that just breaks, you know, oh, we deus ex it. No, it's usually to just add some sort of layer of complexity to the the intricacy of plots and things and stuff like that. So, Right. And one thing I wanted to note too, you know, Patrick, you talked about how popular this was, how much you loved it. And I think one thing to look at is just how accessible this movie was, or sorry, how accessible the series was upon release. I mean, it was distributed by Cartoon Network on Adult Swim. 
And I think having the English dub mm-hmm. and really being able to release that to such a wide audience mm-hmm. and it's already a plot, like you said, that is just so fascinating and just so well done that of course, once that's released to a wide net of people through, um, through Cartoon Network, you're going to get a lot of fans in the US market. So that just made a lot of sense to have some sort of adaptation or release that Hollywood could look to to have some sort of success. For sure. It was it was big enough that a Hollywood version of it was bound to happen. It was just a question of when. Yeah. And I have to confess, when I first heard that this was going to be coming to Netflix, I was slightly excited. Hmm. Oh, I don't know I was why. Very exci- back, I was but... very excited. Hmm. And that's where I think it is an interesting film for the hype, right? Um, one thing I was remembering and have mentioned and just contrasting in my head is this is also, let me ask a question. Were you hyped? Does this film have more hype than maybe you had for a film released in the same year that was an adaptation of an anime, The Ghost in the Shell with Scarlett Johansson? Yes, I was more excited for this because Ghost in the Shell, I remember, got a lot of publicity because of the the you know the the, the whitewashing aspect yeah. of it. It got a lot of negative publicity early on before it even came out. Hmm. Whereas at least for me, I didn't if there was negative publicity about Death Note, I wasn't very much aware of it. And I think mm-hmm. I had the benefit of I had no knowledge of the director. I, other than Willem Dafoe, I had no knowledge of any of the cast. So right. my expectations were very much a blank slate, so to speak. And it's it's interesting, you know. I'm I'm with that same camp, being excited for it. But does Hollywood have a good track record when it comes to adapting anime? Oh no! Oh no! No 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 no! And that actually begs the question: Can there be a successful anime adaptation? In Hollywood, hmm. Hmm. the easy answer of like is like, of course, yes, there could be, but Theoret- it's right. It's a theoretically yes. There, I was, there's been examples. Well, sort yeah. of. There's right. sort of been examples, right? Because I I want to add just one little twist there on that, Patrick. You ask a really good question. Can there be a successful adaptation? Well, what does it mean to successfully adapt something? Is another thing that it you know muddles that answer. I think we could do a whole podcast just on that would, question. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, we do have our key markers, right? Like how much money did it make and how was it received critically? Right. And, and then also yeah. how was it received by the fans? And so if we look uh, at those three indicators. I think you yeah. just hit the key. The money is the money, right? There's plenty right. of stuff that, that can bomb that's good, right? And there's plenty of stuff that can do very well at the box office that maybe the fans don't like. I think right. the fan reception thing here is key because yeah. I don't know how you would pull this, but I'm willing to bet that if you showed this movie to a hundred people that had no knowledge of the anime, they might they might think it was okay. Mm. But I don't know anybody that liked the anime that thought highly of this. Yeah, that's a really fair point. And let's I mean, I have a long list of US anime adaptations that are just it's just depressing to look at the list but (laughs) even just two examples that did well i mean you'll both agree edge of tomorrow like if if there are listeners here that don't know yes um edge of tomorrow is adapted from a japanese light novel and manga right technically not an anime right but technically not an anime but yeah, for the sake a very of the conversation, successful adaptation, under that same sure. umbrella, yeah. Well, a successful adaptation critically and monetarily, yes. I I have no idea what the fan reception to Edge of Tomorrow is in terms of yeah, we really liked how it was consistent with the with with the source material because I didn't know until those credits rolled that it was at all related to anything, and <laughs> I didn't either. Right. right, which is probably to its benefit that it was a good movie <laughs> to some extent, which right. is maybe we'll get into as we break this down a little bit more, is is a good adaptation mean you have to sacrifice that 
animeness of it or something like that. That's an interesting idea. But Anton, right. please continue. And I was going to say um, another film as well that did very well in the box office and critically had, you know, great, like great reception was Alita Battle Angel, of course, from the famous Battle Angel Alita series. I don't know why they changed the order for the film, but two very like two yeah. like very strong films that were adapted. And you could look at one example and see where studio said, let's take the base concept and use that as inspiration for elements, but execute on a story that is a very different interpretation. But at the, at the end of the day, like a spiritual successor, whereas one is much more faithful in terms of storytelling of the adaptation. So we have two very distinct examples of how studios have successfully adapted anime. And then there's the rest. Yeah. That's the point, right? These two that we just mentioned, they are very much the exceptions. Just to name a few for our listeners, so that way you can go back and take a look. Uh, just just a few. Check out Fist of the North Star. It's a film from 1995. Um, 2009's Dragon Ball Evolution. We talked about it earlier. If you want some nightmares. Ghost in the Shell, released in the same year as Death Note. So... That had um, that did have its own box office return, which we'll touch on later. And then for 2023, a major theatrical release was for Knights of the Zodiac for a longtime anime fans. Um, and that is doing terribly in the box office. I don't think they've made their money back. And for honorable mention, I do want to mention, of course, the 2021 Netflix adaptation of Cowboy Bebop. Not a film, but hey, check it out. And then finger guns is basically what the producers did. Look, it's okay that it's not a film, right? At, at, at this point, we will take any decent adaptation of an anime. <laughs> Please, just like, do we're it. We're not right. being picky yeah. here. Just give us, give us something good. Right. So there, there's a lot of reasons why we wanted to review this film. Let's start to dive into the production history. Um, Patrick, did you want to uh, kick us off? And So with the enormous popularity of the manga and the subsequent anime adaptation, as early as 2007, there were reportedly at least 10 different film studios that were interested in bringing Death Note to Hollywood. An American mm -hmm. production company called Vertigo Entertainment was originally set to develop the remake with Charlie and Vlas. Parla Panitas as screenwriters. Two years later, Warner Brothers acquired the film rights and they decided to move forward with the two original screenwriters. And I'm um, out of respect to their names, I think that's the last time I'm going to try to pronounce them. <laughs> so at one point, Zach Efron, of all people, was reportedly being sought to play light, but this never actually got serious. So let's think about what that might have been like. I'm going to assume not great. I, I remember reading that in Otaku magazine. That's not the first time I've heard Zac Efron referred to as a being in a potential anime adaptation. I so, actually don't know enough. Is he like a big? Is he a big anime guy? I don't know is if that he's why? a big anime fan, but I think it's appearance. And then if you look at how lights, just how lights drawn and illustrated, they basically have the same haircut. Hmm. Um, but I do actually think, especially after seeing him in the Ted Bundy film, I, f I think that was a Netflix release. Actually, I think, I think so, he actually yeah. could have done a really done really well as light. Um, but for hmm. other reasons that I'll dive into later. As early as 2011, it was announced that Shane Black had been hired to direct. Now, Black is best known for writing the scripts for movies like Lethal Weapon and The Long Kiss Goodnight. He also directed and wrote uh, an excellent movie with Robert Downey Jr. called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and he would later go on to write and direct Iron Man 3. Now, Warner Brothers, they wanted to change Light's story from justice to vengeance, and they wanted to omit the Shinigami part of this story altogether. Now, Shane Black opposed this change, and they could not agree on how to move forward. He remained interested for another couple of years, but finally it was rumored that Gus Van Sant would be replacing him. Gus Van Sant is a, a great director. Probably Directed Good Milk. Will Hunting, I'm going to assume, is his best known movie at this point. Uh, Good Will Hunting, excellent film. 
Yeah. And yeah. a Sean Connery movie, Finding Forrester, shout out. But the Van Sant thing ended up going nowhere. In 2015, it was announced that Adam Wingard would be the new director. Now, Wingard <laughs> is arguably best known for directing one of the Blair Witch movies. Now, from I can only speak for myself here, but I think it says a lot when you have to Google the fact that I did not know that there was one more than one Blair Witch movie. So, <laughs> Well, there was the, I always knew that there was the first and then the second. And then they made another one in 2016 that was the same title as the first one, Blair Witch. Like they didn't change anything. So that's not confusing. I, I'd never heard of it. Like, no, I, I was like, what, another Blair Witch? Really? But it's a continuation of the first film. Did you see it? No. Absolutely no. not. Nathan, any, you see that? No, I, no, nope. I think, I we, have, all, think we all dodged a bullet there. I have seen one Adam Wingard movie, <laughs> and that's about it. Is this the one? This is the one. Yes. Yeah. Same. Uh, I uh, again, it's, he's he's apparently doing well these days, but uh, before that, just yeah. a lot of kind of horror stuff. In April 2016, the Rap reported that Warner Brothers was dropping the Death Note project. However, the studio allowed Wingard to take the project elsewhere. Netflix ended up acquiring this, and they announced that a new draft of the script was being written by Jeremy Slater. So basically, Netflix picked this one off the scrap heap, and they decided to make it for cheap. Mm -hmm. Filming began in June of 2016 in Vancouver, British Columbia, which subbed in for Seattle. Wingard addressed the whitewashing concerns over the film before its release, explaining that the film is an American take on the Death Note story. He stated, quote, it's one of those things where the harder I tried to stay 100% true to the source material, the more it just kind of fell apart. You're in a different country, you're in a different kind of environment, and you're trying to also summarize a sprawling series into a two-hour film. For me, it became about what do these themes mean to modern-day America, and how does that affect how we tell the story, end quote. And in an I interview... Love how, I love how he tries to sound noble. <laughs> he does. Yeah. Well, Yeah. <laughs> Like, no comment. Uh, in an interview with Heat Vision, Wingard stated that Netflix had wanted to make at least two films. Obviously, we know that hasn't happened yet. Although, Nathan, apparently another one may be coming. I mean, by, it's... By not a Russo brother. By not a Russo brother, yeah. Uh, like, I mean, it's it's one of those things. I mean, you things pop up here and there, right? Someone says I'm still interested and that keeps the conversation going at least. Right. I mean, I don't think there's anything at this point to say, yep, that's definitely happening. Um, you know, there's often lots of talks about stuff, but the fact that it's still like something that every, seems like every year someone asks the question that kind of comes up is it's interesting in light of the movie that we watched. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's it's clear that this was a movie designed to have at least one other movie. I mean, it's just you based on the ending. I mean, obviously, that's that was their intent. There's but nothing who, else who here. asked for it. Who asked for another Death Note movie? Is my question. Well, or was you it go the studio? in. Was it the was it the fans? The rabid fans of the first one. Well, I mean, I mean, it's one of those things that probably when you pitch it, it's like we we can't do death note beginning to end in two hours like that's just like at least they they didn't have the audacity to try to do that um mm. i mean truly beginning to end i mean clearly True. they were they were like they were like yeah we'll definitely get two movies out of this netflix is flush they're riding high they're just gonna green light anything um especially in 2017 right yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe. I mean, that's just conjecture, but that kind of feels, I mean, the fact that they were like, yeah, you know what, we'll, we'll pick, we'll grab this. Oh, I think, I think you're onto something there. I don't know about now, but back then Netflix was very much into the, the pump and dump strategy of just get, just get as much oh, original right. content right. out yeah. onto the streaming platform as possible, sure. as Throw much as we can wall. do. Shocking approach. Sticks. Yeah. Yeah, not not worrying too much about, you know, because you never know what's going to be hot, right? 
yeah. you know, you never know that if if this little the, the little movie that that tries to adapt this anime oh. becomes the thing that everybody loves, right? You know, there's yeah. a there's uh, not saying this particular film, but like there's a there's a reality where that can happen. Not saying for what this film was, but there's a reality where that happens. Netflix is like, yeah, let's do it. Let's green light like three more films. Let's take this to the next level. Yeah, Netflix was like, let's do this. Let's also do women in prison. Let's do The Witcher. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> those are some examples of where things like kind of worked a bit better. Worked a bit better, right? Yeah. But just a little speaking bit. Speaking of better, let's talk about why Death Note wasn't better. Hmm. Oh, fun. Yeah, you like that segue? Yeah. Number one, the thing that sticks out to me the most is the runtime when it comes mm-hmm. to adapting the anime. I think I speak for a lot of fans of the anime when I say that this should have never been a movie. A series would have made more sense. I mm-hmm. think this was doomed from the start. I don't think this had any chance of being good the way they chose to adapt it, and that is specifically starting with how short of a movie this is. Hmm. I mean, I'm happy because it was less time we had to spend watching it. That is a but, very good point. I, I did think but, of that. I'm like, well, it's, it's only, of, it's only that, oh, 90 minutes. Such... I know, I know. I looked, <laughs> I looked at it and I'm like, oh, great. If we're not going to have to, I'm not going to have to spend all day. Um, but going into it blindly, it's like, this is, it goes by fast and you're like, what was that? Yeah. Now, yeah. Nathan, you mentioned they didn't try to adapt the entire story into this movie. Yeah. But they did it seemed like they were trying to fit huge chunks of it in. Well, they were still trying to get to a some I mean it's clear they were trying to get to some conclusion, right? In some way. Yes. Whether that's trying to develop the characters in a direction and take them through an arc, right? Right? I mean, I think you know, getting into it, um I think that clearly there was a a vision here to some extent, maybe vision's a little too strong. There was clearly some sort of muddled, uh, you know, kind of idea of saying, let's move our character like light Turner. He gets this, he gets this death note, right? He gets this book. It lets him kill people. And, you know, kind of, I think moving from a space where he's supposed to be more kind of conflicted about that. Like he's high on the power of it at the beginning, but he still kind of has a little bit of that, that conscious like conscience about it a little bit um he's not sure exactly what it means to do that and to take him sort of to an arc by the end of it where he's making more maybe he's reacting less and make taking more active choices that maybe puts it in the best light that it can. the best light <laughs> the best light turner the, that, that is the best. That is the best light turner I could possibly try to sell for what this, you know, what the character like story progression is supposed to be through this, and then maybe a, it, you know, I know we're getting now and like flipping it around and talking about what could have been for this movie, but like, and then maybe if you had a second movie, you then kind of maybe solidify into what that final kind of clash or whatever is going to look like. Right. Yeah, it's it's strange because this movie it does have a beginning, middle, and end, mm-hmm. but they certainly leave it open for the possibility of a sequel at the same time. To me, like when I watched it last week, what struck me is it felt like the pilot to a TV series rather than a complete film. I could not find much information on how much they actually cut out of this movie, but I do think mm. there's some really glaring examples where they did cut additional scenes out and it would have benefited them to keep it in. I just find the runtime so curious because this wasn't a theatrical release. They didn't need to fit into movie theaters like schedules. Yeah. So I would love to know more about the decision making behind the scenes. Why was the decision made to make this 90 minutes? Like even I'm not saying mate having this been two hours would have saved it, but no, no, it would have told him I, I just 90 minutes is so limiting for the type of story that death note is right yeah there's so much I mean, detail in the anime i mean maybe they realized who they had and who they had as their light Fair. turner and who they had as you know this mia uh, mia character and all of these other things and they're like we got to tighten this thing up 
um, we got to keep this rolling because the more time that we put these people on screen, the more people are going to kind of, it's going to start not fitting something. Or I mean, even just like understanding the, the budget that they had to put into animating Ryuk, um, that was probably a decent chunk. I mean, I, I do have to say like, for me, that's one of the more redeeming qualities, but and in terms of impact on the runtime, maybe they just didn't have like it was just working out how do we fit that into fit the the timing in terms of the budget and what else we can have the budget for for the film. So the anime does such a wonderful job of laying out the cat and mouse game between Light and L. Yeah, my favorite thing about the anime it's probably the same for most people yeah. that end up seeing it, right? It's, it's cerebral, it's smart, and yeah, it's... they're doing who, who? Which one of you mentioned the Sherlock Holmes of it all? Like that's exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's psych, Sherlock it's and Moriarty. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, it's no, definitely, it's it's a it's Sherlock Holmes, but turned up, which is kind of one of the interesting things I think if you think about adapting Death Note is what what do you need to do and and maybe this is an interesting segue more directly into casting is like if you look at the anime like you have a you know a set of characters especially one very unique right character our sherlock holmes right the guy trying to catch the villain our james moriarty if if light turner kira is our moriarty the the villain yeah. or ostensibly who should be the villain we have our l who's like our Sherlock Holmes, who's Sherlock Holmes is already a character known and kind of considered eccentric and brilliant at the same time. And now you've got a character that you read the manga or you watch the anime and he's eaten cake and not wearing shoes and he's uh, slovenly and he's just kind of this, this weird eccentric character. And this is kind of, this is where we get into something interesting when we want to talk about adapting anime to me, which is, is that something that you carry forward? Is that a flavor? Or are you uh, like, if you disregard that when you adapt Death Note and you instead make it more serious, you, maybe we tighten up like the, the cat and mouse. But if we lose some of that characterization, are you losing something? But definitely this film had some of that characterization. I mean, I think that uh, Elle's actor really, really went in for it. Right. And so there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of layers and depth to the characters of the original anime. Yeah. And I think, you know, the clear point here is how do you capture that? How do you capture the in intricacies with such a limited runtime? And I think like, yes, that definitely impacted this film. And I don't oh. think that 90 yeah. minutes was sufficient even I, for just what no. they tried to adapt. Yeah, I don't see exactly 90 minutes is you're almost getting to a one hour pilot of like a first episode of a show. This could have been three episodes or something like that as an arc or more. Screenwriter Jeremy Slater, he said in an interview that the movie resembled Michael Mann's Heat, but with teenagers instead of, of, of adults. <laughs> I, I thought this was just Sorry. an absurd comparison for him to make. Heat is like a three hour movie. Right. Mm. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot the, of time for that cat and mouse game in that mm. to unfold. And yeah. it's Anton, I was reminded a bit about our discussion about on on the first episode, the first the first movie we ever covered, Tim Burton's mm -hmm. Planet of the Apes. If you remember, Burton said something about his version wasn't a remake, but a reimagining. Mm. Right. I think that this suffers from a very similar problem. They said that they wanted to do their own version, right? Like, what's mm. his name? Wingard said this is like this is an American version of this story, right? But yeah. at the same time, they didn't take the expectations into consideration. Hmm. They they actually rely on several montages in this movie to to tell parts of the story, right? They montage their way through some of the most important parts of Light's character development, specifically how how he decides to become the persona of Kara, of Kira in the anime. Think about how pivotal <laughs> that is in the anime. That's just a Japanese word for killer. Right. I'll, it'll be, yeah, it's sort of like a killer. Uh, within five minutes of finding the death note, in this movie, he becomes a full-fledged, like, global mass murderer. Like, I I'm sorry, like, there's just no way, you cannot montage your way through that. Right, and it's, I think, I wanted to use this as an exercise for comparison. 
So let's compare that first five minutes or even the first 10 minutes of the film. And let's think about the source material. And Hmm. I'm speaking to the first episode of the anime, which was roughly 20 minutes. So just big shout out, opening themes, a banger, ending themes, also a banger. Um, But episode one, you establish Light as a genius with a strong sense of justice. He's an upstanding citizen, um, very good family life. And but at the same time, um, you also see elements that this is part of the supernatural world. He finds a death note and unprompted by any outside source, he just starts testing it and how it works in a very calculated way. You get into the layers and depth of his of his intelligence and you really believe that this is someone that is uh, that is you know said to be a genius and then is approached by Ryuk, the Shinigami who reveals the implications and stakes if he says yes to this death note as though it's some Faustian deal. And Light relishes in the opportunity. It sets the stage for the anime. It's exciting. It shows that this is a character driven by a strong sense of justice. Mm. And that's exciting. And you get all of that development, understanding of characters, universe building in 20 minutes. That would have taken 22% of the film's runtime to follow a similar formula. So I'm not saying the film had to go the same route, but that's just an example of what you can get to an anime. If you get out of an anime that's pacing with that characterization, that's based on having more episodes put out versus trying to rush something through a full film. It's a great way to look at it. Yeah. I was going to mention this a little bit later, but everything that you were talking about, like just how, how much it took its time. Hmm. It's that is the exact reason why I, there's just no way I, I, a movie adaptation of this would work. That was one of the best things about the anime of how meticulous it was, how tactical it was. Like when Light gets the Death Note, it it really takes his time unfolding with right. telling the you know the viewer how does it work. Hmm. He experiments with it. He doesn't you know he doesn't really believe it at first but and every time you as the viewer every time in your mind you ask well what about this what about that they answer it light thinks of everything he always covers his tracks I don't re- I don't know which episode it was it was one of the early ones but like almost the entire episode is spent on him uh explaining how he like um secures the note in his desk and it's booby trapped mm-hmm. and how he doesn't want anyone to get to it yeah and then even as the series progresses, you just get to see that more and more, right? Things take their time. I mean, that's one of the things that stands out, I think, about uh, Death Note is that it's a series that is not action like in so many ways because it's all about these plans, right? We get back to that Sherlock Holmes, the cat and the mouse, right? It's these plans within plans kinds of things. And you get that, you get that experience of like seeing it all like play out and you're like, oh my gosh, that was planted three episodes ago and it's now coming to fruition and you get to see how all that moves through. Yes. Whereas at this point, this really does feel, feel more, like you're just seeing things glossed over. You're getting bits and pieces of the story scattered about, but it's just flipping through. It's a fast run time. Yeah. You know, I see like in our notes, like this is, I think this is a great way to put it. It's, it's basically death note cliff notes. It's yeah, the death cliffs. cliff notes. Death's cliffs notes. <laughs> there's like no that. substance to any scene. Nothing. There's no really? drama. There's no, there's no real, they don't earn any of the tension that they're trying to build towards because right. they're, gl- they're right. glossing over every bit of the story. Well, we don't even really get into any sort of like what makes this an enduring series, like the mind games, right? The like plots, right? The like, this is exactly as I planned kind of thing until like maybe they, they sort of gesture at that with the ending gestures, maybe a bit generous um, of like finally having someone come up with a plan and executing it and it being like, oh, I didn't see that coming or necessarily see it telegraphed easily. It very much reminds me of, of similar problems. Do you ever see David Lynch's Dune? <laughs> yes. 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 So yes. Dune is a notoriously difficult book to adapt. Now, it, it's been adapted uh, very recently, uh, much more successfully. Yeah. But one of the things that I think they wisely omitted from the recent adaptation was the the characters' inner monologues, hmm. their inner thoughts. 
Yeah. That's something that you see all the time in anime, and that's probably the most difficult thing to bring to a big screen movie adaptation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, the David Lynch Dune tried to do it (laughs) with, um, I'm going to say, less than stellar results. Mm -hmm. I think that they were... It probably benefited the filmmakers on this version of Death Note to not include it. But at the same time, that's why I just don't think that this story was ever going to work as a movie. Is The the inner monologue piece of it was such a big part of the anime, and you're losing it here. There's just no substance to anything. I I see what you're saying, and I think that maybe that's where you hope to have a good writer that can translate that more effectively. Maybe you don't necessarily need an inner monologue. Maybe you just need more time to really show like intricacies, layering. Um, how does how does a character with their actions display how cerebral they really are? And I think that does take time. That does take very smart cinematography, very smart um, shots through the mm-hmm. filming. But at, all we know for sure they did not capture any of that. Um, and no. the limited runtime was just too hard. I don't even think they yeah. set things up well at all. Like I have in my notes here, I was taking notes as I watched it. The movie starts off horribly. Where does it take place? A school, a shipyard, the hood? It keeps cross-cutting between cheerleaders and what appears to be like hookers getting arrested in the hood. And it's all set to an alt-rock song. And eventually well, it gets to a high school, but I don't even think they set sense. it up correctly. It all makes sense to me. <laughs> this is a wor- <laughs> This is a dark world that needs justice. <laughs> Yeah, they but, really, they really sold it. But that's also, I mean, we can get into characterization and maybe where there were big missteps in the adaptation, because you get into sort of the difference between in the writing, at least, of like, is this is their main character right? Light is he doing this for a sense of justice or a sense of like kind of adolescent vengeance, kind of like. You know, there, there's a very different characterization that we see from this movie. I think this is starting to take us into our second reason. So if we feel good, should we should we dive in there? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think, I think so. Let's. So the, the second reason we've been touching on it a bit now, it's the characters and the acting. So do we have any thoughts on what did before we start going into what didn't go well? Because I know we have lots of opinions on that. Sure. What? Is it what, if anything, do we think was characterized well or what was acted well? Willem Dafoe, Mm -hmm. other than him, did we like any of the performances here? Did we like how the characters were written? No. (laughs) All right. Well, that's it for this week's edition of uh, Why Wasn't It Better? No. um, Willem Dafoe is Ryuk. I think he's very good. He's not in it a lot. No, No, he's not. He's it, it. On the and and in my take on it is I think it works. I think it's a great. He has a great voice for that character, mm-hmm. and you know he's able to kind of ham it up a bit. You know he's William Defoe. He can do that. Um, at times, it also feels a little bit like it's just William Defoe saying. Like, I was going to say, was he, like, was are we sure that this was William Defoe trying to tap in? to the Shinigami Ryuk, or is he just using the same voice that he did as the Green Goblin in Spider-Man? Right. Like, Avenge me! <laughs> <laughs> like, and that's where it's, it's like a little hard to, anyway, like, I don't want to like say too much like bad. I mean, obviously he's in the movie for like, you know, 12 lines or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's it's also something that, at least for me, listening to it, there's a little bit of just that. Oh, is this is this this character, or is this just William Defoe? Yeah, yeah. That's I, fair. I mean, it's. I mean, it's I not guess bad. considering if you look at the whole package, they got that part right, Ryuk. They, they didn't screw it up, right? Unlike the other characters. Now, th- I have I do have an interesting quote for Willem Defoe in an interview with IGN. And they asked if he had a chance to check out the source material before you know, he committed to the film. Willem Dafoe responded, quote, not so much. I didn't feel the need. Sometimes you feel like you have to do research to make something. Other times, you know, you don't feel it so much. I felt it was pure if I just responded to the story, the images, and what Adam told me he envisioned. It's not a rejection of pre-existing material. It's 
just we like to keep true to your impulses. I kind of let the integrity of the source rest with Adam, end quote. Fair so that, enough. If that's not a little telling of yeah. his style. <laughs> I or mean, just a little telling of the situation. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, what, what are you going to do? Not say? Are you going to say no to what? Walking into a walking into a recording session for like what a day or something? Knocking that out? Yeah, you know? I could, he he must have worked for like a day or two at yeah, the most. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to say no if to that. that. If twenty that. minutes. Yeah. Let's well, talk I mean, about Light Turner. <laughs> and how smart he is. You mentioned he's a genius, right? Uh, in the anime. original source, in the so original source yeah, material. You mean, yes, you mean yes. Light Yagami. Right. Uh, his intelligence in the anime was matched only by his ruthlessness, right? And at one point, one of the coolest parts of the anime for me, one of the most memorable parts is um, it's pretty early in the series. Do you remember when Ryuk is like surprised at how ruthless he is? Yeah. Yes. He like impresses him. Yeah. I didn't see any of these qualities in Nat Wolf's portrayal of this character. Now, I don't know if uh, you guys uh, watched a couple of uh, interviews that Nat Wolf gave about this movie. In one of them, he stated that Light only kills people for no reason. I, I don't think that he actually watched or read the source it. material. Or the movie that he was in. Yes. <laughs> Apparently. Film critic Brian... Talarico, he stated in his review, which was negative, that the film failed because, quote, it refused to make light the anti-hero that he needed to be, end quote. I actually agree with this. They don't really seem to commit in this movie to like yeah. what they actually <laughs> want light to be. They they seem to try a couple different times to make him out as some kind of good guy. Mm. Like, oh, mm. he's not in control. He didn't know his girlfriend would do that. Do that. Yeah. He doesn't want to kill the police officers, right? He doesn't want to kill the agents. Right. Yeah. And that's right. okay, right? Initially, like in in the anime, Light initially has reservations about some of the stuff that he's doing, mm -hmm. but when yeah. the, when the series really gets going is when he just fully commits to being Kira. He's like there's no going back now. I'm doing this. Oh, I as it's funny. I like as prep, I know Anton you watched like what the first episode or two or something like that. Right. I read the first two chapters of the manga and like the, the famous scene when, when L shows up on screen to try to find out where Kira is like light. This is the second, second chapter of this, of this manga. He's already like, Oh, that guy on the TV screen, uh, he's going to pose me, write his name down. He's dead. Get rid of that guy. <laughs> like, like day, like, yes, he, yes. it's gone. And how it's, it's interesting. Cause I, one of the things that I've always thought of about Death Note is I remember when I watched the anime for the first time and you're getting it, you're getting wrapped into the story, right? It's got all the ups and the downs. It's got those slow bits where you're like, where is this going? And then boom, like, you know, one, one, you know, one plot revealed and you're like, what? And it, it just keeps you going. It keeps you enraptured and so much going on. And I don't want to get into all of like plot of what the original series was, but I remember getting to the end of it and sudden, having the sudden realization that I'm like, wait a second, I'm cheering. I want, I, where I realized I was like cheering for light as a character. Like I was like anticipating and looking forward to him succeeding and stuff. And I'm like, wait a second. Isn't he the one who's like murdering like people all around the world and is like the, an the antagonist by all accounts of the story? I wouldn't say I ever got that from the light Turner in no. this film. No, there is no point at which I could see him being the character that I'm like, Oh, he's like the depth, uh, the or not maybe not the depth. Maybe that's the wrong phrase, but like, oh, he's the character that I'm like that I'm like uh, conflicted about how I'm like cheering for him. And that's honestly, I think that's amazing, right? That they were able to write such a riveting character, and they're able to yeah. write such a riveting story. And before I start to talk about characterization and how important that is with the writing and the characters that they adapted. I do want to cut some slack to um, Nat Wolf. Let's let, let's cut the guy some slack. No, he maybe he didn't read the source material, but I'm also not entirely convinced he can read. So let's just put that out there. But really, I wanted to talk about. You know, we've been touching on a lot characterization of light and just characterization of just in general. 
when we're adapting, it's important to think of what made the original characterization and how it was written and displayed in original media so popular. What we had in the original anime was Light's character was someone who was so well-liked and intelligent and for all intents and purposes, a model citizen. And mm. that crafted so well for a very complex sociopath, anti-hero that justified mass murder in the name of justice. And that to me is a much more interesting character compared to what Netflix greenlit, which was essentially an angsty mm. teenager yeah. who's kind of smart and portrayed as more sympathetic and regretful of his actions. So basically, they created a more flawed human being sad boy versus a Zac Efron master detective Ted Bundy. And maybe they thought it would resonate more with U.S. viewers, but yeah. who would watch that? Who would really want to watch that and it's just such a shame that they had already such a strong characterization in the original source material it's funny because like what you described mm -hmm. as isolated sad boy who gets this power to murder people yeah. and it's now the hunt is on that's clearly the villain in your movie that's clearly the person that you're like they give the sympathetic backstory to but you're rooting to go and have like defeated and you're just you know and you don't even maybe even really follow them. You give them the really sad, tragic backstory, you know, all this stuff. And now they're angsty and they're, they're your, they're your bad guy, right? They're not your lead. Right. That's what this movie fails completely at is mm -hmm. to your point. He is very clearly the bad guy in the anime, mm -hmm. but it's such a well-written character that you find yourself rooting for him regardless. Yeah. They didn't even make an attempt to do that here they they try to make him sympathetic but the stuff that he's doing i don't think there is a way to make that sympathetic they never fully yeah. committed to it either they'd have to really recharacterize it i know that you know from interviews and kind of discussion uh, apparently uh the director adam really was trying to make his girlfriend the sort of dark side of it which honestly just sounds terrible and just and was terrible and just complicated and muddled the whole characterization what, like you're trying to split someone into two people and have a conflict about that, especially a conflict that never existed in the original source right. material. Oh, we'll get to her. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I have another quote from Nat Wolf for you. Quote, Light starts off as someone who sees himself as the hero. As the movie progresses, he realizes he's not in the right. End quote. This is a major flaw depict depicting Light. We already touched on this a, a little bit, but once in the in the source material, once he conceived of the Kira idea, Light never doubted himself. He thought of himself as some type of god, as like justice personified. And it's so out of character when the movie... When I, he says something like to uh, me, like, we're not the good guys anymore. He never mm -hmm. had that kind of self-doubt in right. the anime. Now, that's yeah. not Nat Wolf's fault, right? That part, I won't blame him for that. That's just how they wrote this. Mm. But he's supposed to be smart, right? Mm. Well, this is the part where we can talk about how smart his character <laughs> is or maybe is not. Well, I think that in order to fit their characterization as this sort of flawed human character, he needs to be reacting to things not in charge of things right i mean that's the that's again one of the chilling interesting things about the original source material is like light is in charge of all of it right even when it seems like he's losing you find out later that it was all it was all according to plan right it was right. always that was the way it was supposed to be but instead in order to make him you need to make him more of a dunce right oh i didn't realize my girlfriend was doing this i didn't realize that they were on to me oh, i didn't realize right he has to and thus you undercut this idea of him being you know brutally efficiently intelligent yeah and they they kind of botch at the end too because the end seems to imply that he had all these things accounted for but yeah. that doesn't really make sense when you're watching the movie because he gets caught off guard a lot. Specifically, the scene that got me the most in, in all the worst ways was the second the L confronts him in that like uh, cafe, he just starts cracking under pressure immediately. He, he starts getting angry. He starts making <laughs> yeah. vague threats. He's like, you don't know what you don't understand what you're doing. It yeah. doesn't really do anything to support his intelligence, right? He, he basically, I think he actually literally tells him at one point, you think you're better than me. Yeah, it's, I, I really wanted to avoid going this route 
in saying this because it just makes me sound like an even bigger nerd than I am, but or light from the anime would not do that. Right. No. Because he no. is so intelligent and would be thinking, how do I calmly approach the situation and think ahead? How do I cerebrally, cerebrally, um, strategically, um, react? Right. If it wasn't even always his plan to begin with, which is half the time when these incidents happen in like the manga anime. Oh, right. right. It's he's, like he's, he's already, already he's already he's, thought of what to this do. This was his plan all along was to be confronted in this coffee shop kind of thing. Like it's right. just, yeah. you know, the, again, they kind of try to grasp, they gesture to it at the end to try to be like, oh, well, he actually had a plan. And maybe they were trying to go with a sort of, this is when he hardens. This is when he doubles down and says, I'm going to stop reacting and stop being a victim to all the things around me. I'm going to now become, you know, Kira or whatever. And, you know, if they ever do that, you know, maybe that's how they would try to characterize the character in the future and try to write it. But it's a miss here, right? It's trying to build an origin story, mm -hmm. you know, but I don't know if you need that origin story. <laughs> you know what I mean? No. Like in this way, right? No, I, they just, everything is just glossed over. Like they, they, mm -hmm. we know he's smart because he does other people's homework. <laughs> right. But then right. they immediately, like with, in less than 10 minutes, they immediately contradict it because his dumb ass, as soon as he meets <laughs> Mia, he's just like, Hey, check out this sick death note I found. <laughs> Oh my it's, gosh. There's just it, like within 10 minutes, you're like, it, how smart is this guy? Should he even have this death note? No. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I think that this is a point where being fans of the anime, it's causing a mental block for us to be able to accept the story for what it is hmm. in that it's based on a source material. It's not necessarily the source material. But the way that they interpreted it was they had really good source material that they could have worked with. But instead, they decided to try to adapt inspiration for a U.S. Mm. audience. And they tried mm. to also think of who is the U.S. audience that we want to reach. And they wrote it. And this is my just I'm guessing they were trying to reach teens and young adults. And hmm. maybe this was their characterization because they said this is what would happen if the Death Note were to appear in 2017 Seattle and a random sad boy teen picked it up. This is the right. story that we're going to write and we're going to use death notes in it. Cause that sounded pretty sick. There's, there's something there, Anton, there is an element of sort of, is this playing to the sad angsty sad boys or like, Oh, if I just had a death note, like, you know, I could fix the world. Oh, right? I think that's kind definitely what they were going for. Yeah. Yeah, which is a, you know, what's interesting is maybe you could do an interesting thing with that. But I think you would need to, like, commit to that in a way of, like... Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things of also why I, I thought this was an interesting movie is there is an element that I do appreciate when you have the chance to adapt something of, like, you, you can do a real hardline adaptation, right? And you can try to be, like really close to the source material. You can also be, you know, Edge of Tomorrow and take a lot of inspiration, but I imagine they cut out a lot of the characters, the anime-ness or whatever of that in order to keep the core things there. So I think it's interesting when you take something like this and you, okay, we want to recontextualize it. Let's set it in America. I don't think that's like a bad thing, right? Oh, yeah. I think that you can do that and you could do that in a way and but it's this this sort of half mixed thing right it's sort of like well what yeah. are we really what are we i mean do we really just need to take this and okay you shift it to america but repeat everything else about it i understand where from a writing standpoint that may be feel boring or may feel like a lack of but instead you produce this right right you you, you get a, a essentially a watered a watered down a story of Death Note and a watered down teen romance. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's like part Twilight, part Final Destination, and yeah. a little bit yeah. of Death Note. It reminds me also, there's just a tad of it of like, it also made me think of uh, Chronicle. 
Um, oh yeah, just a little bit. I can of, see where you're going. But in a weird way, if they had doubled down on that, like maybe it could have at least made it more consistent and interesting, right? I mean, I, we can get into all sorts of what ifs, but if you kind of reshifted how you wanted to spin this movie, maybe you could do it in a different way. But instead, they kind of came up with this where they still wanted to make light the main character, but wanted to try to make him something that doesn't fit the story. Right. They instead they wanted to write in a light that was a complete spaz. Um let, and, re, and reacting to everything his, around him, right? His screaming, just... his screaming when he first encounters Ryuk, genuinely like, hilariously bad acting. He's, oh yeah. Ah! Or when he sees the um beheading scene of the bully, his reaction, total overacting. Hmm. Yeah, he's uh the story's telling stuff that they screwed up is pretty unforgivable, but they didn't even like they didn't even get the basics right. Like did you at least hire a good actor? Uh no. Right. No. No. Right. Well, let's let's talk about this. They did hire a good actor in in in, in Lake at Stanfield or in Stanfield. Yes, they did. And, how, and what someone do, who what, what do we think of Al? Well, I have two minds on this. I think Stanfield's performance I think he genuinely cared about the material. He was mm-hmm. trying, and he at least succeeded in giving the character some type of a personality. Hmm. I don't know how well the character was written. I don't know if he was given very good material to work with. I have two examples that I found that were kind of hilarious watching this. So they introduce his character in Tokyo, speaking Japanese to a Japanese policeman, but he's not Japanese, and he never speaks Japanese again for the rest of the movie. A little weird... Not- a little no- it's just a I just know it's not strange. a nod there's not a nod Nathan it's a bow <laughs> right <laughs> the other the other thing i noticed there's actually three examples the second one is they unlike the anime they give him a reason that he eats candy like the insulin spike gives you energy is what watari tells him well, of all the details to include why this like he just eats candy in the anime cuz he likes candy there's no reason for it and then the the last one that really bugged me is when <laughs> L first contacts Detective Turner, Light's father, right? And he tells him on the phone, Kira is in Seattle, right? He doesn't give an explanation for it initially. He says this on the phone. And then the very next scene, Watari, who gives him the phone to begin with, takes him to see L in person because he's in Seattle. So if you're writing this movie, it's like, why the hell would you include the phone call it's a total waste of screen time. Just have the one scene with them. <laughs> That's a good point. It's a very dramatic scene, but a huge waste of screen time. But that leads me to believe that they might have cut cut things out between that. Because logically, hmm. it doesn't make sense for them to have a phone a meeting on a phone call, and then 30 seconds later, they're talking to each other in person. So I will say, in contrast to uh, Nat Wolf. I uh, was reading a bit about how uh, Lakeith uh, really actually like got into the source material. He said he wa- read all of it, or at least maybe didn't read all of it, but watched the anime, watched the Japanese movies, all of this, and was, you know, I wasn't too familiar with how he went about acting, and it's clear from reading about him in interviews, he gets very method. So he definitely wanted to kind of inhabit that. Which is a interesting character to be like. I want a method act L from Death Note to me. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It just is, yeah. is. It's interesting, right? And clearly, he brought, you know, of any part of that film uh, that a person was acting in um, on screen, he definitely was the most trying to kind of grab something from the original source material Mm -hmm. right i mean yes the eating the candy the standing on chairs and stuff like that or or whatever his little uh squatting on chairs just an interesting thing and clearly reading from interviews he he liked it and he liked the character and was actually you know and this is where we get into some things of him talking about it from an, inter- an interview with buzzfeed about how like they started giving different directions for how he was going to play the character i think originally he wanted it to be even more look like the character from the manga like i'm going to wear jeans and no shoes and like a white t-shirt or something like that 
Uh, now that'd be an image, right? Yeah. <laughs> that would, now that feels a lot more Cowboy Bebop, right? Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, um, I guess I'm glad he didn't do that. Well, I think he was directed not to do that. Well, at least they, maybe they got that right. Um, yeah, well, I mean, and that goes to where, I mean, what do you what do you adapt, right? Is it a, if you just dress everyone up correctly um, and have them all recite the scenes, have you adapted it? Um, or is it, do you also need to bring in some sort of essence of it, you know? Um, I, he's not a bad actor. Um, it just... It it's like adding another layer of does this quite fit, you know? Like, I'm not saying that you could have gotten a better or a more fitting L. Um, I don't think you probably would have gotten someone, you know, who maybe was as dedicated. But it's like now you have a character, oh, an actor who's really dedicated to making the role a certain way, and is that now jiving with the rest of it also? <laughs> yeah, okay. I yeah. Just anything so, to add about L, Anton? You know, I, I think you both said it very well. Um, not much that I want to add there. Before I forget about this, oh, some please. of the worst writing in the movie is early in the movie. After he gets caught cheating, which, by the way, is doing other people's homework, technically cheating, maybe. But he's in the principal's office. It's some of the worst expository dialogue you'll ever hear in a film. The principal says to him, you know your situation is bad because of the way your mom died. No one would actually say this in real life. It's terrible <laughs> nope. dialogue. Nope. It's that's, just that it's, was weird. It's some of the laziest writing. That's all. I just wanted to get that off my chest. You can talk about <laughs> me now. Thank you. Thank you. No wonder he was so mad at the world. Yeah. Just because everyone around him was just so horrible. So, Mia, now we ta- I talked about characterization before, and I feel like this was a an example where it was such a departure from the original character. You could argue it's an original I, character. Yeah, it, it, I don't think there was really anything that i mean maybe some slight elements of how the character used the death note but otherwise like night and day in terms of who mia was versus the misa misa character from the anime well at least according to the director she's not supposed to be misa misa oh good that's great well they succeeded there she's supposed to just be light's dark side Oh, well, it's a good thing that they named her Mia, because that's so not close to Misa. <laughs> right. She's supposed to be the, the the dark cheerleader? Well, we know she's dark because yeah. when she's introduced, she's walking around cheerleading practice, smoking a cigarette in slow motion. So you know she's edgy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and in general, she's just very wild. We can all agree, like, this is loose cannon of all loose cannons in this Terribly film. written. Yeah. No, from the very second she's introduced, she's presented as just this obvious liability. Hmm. Like the, I think one of the first things she says to Light, she's like, "I wish I'd seen that bully get decapitated." <laughs> <laughs> what a freak! Yeah, I know. And he's just like, "Oh yeah, that's normal." Yeah. He's like, "Wow, she's hot." Yeah, <laughs> check out the sick death note I just found. <laughs> but like, you know, I said it before. It's it's not something that the original Light would put himself into a situation with trying to impress this girl while acting as Kira, because that's just a huge liability, right? Again, we're trying to see this from a different lens. I mean, you touched on, there's a love montage of light and Mia talking about solving all the world's problems. I mean, who didn't love that scene of just two high schoolers, like thinking they, they can solve everything by yeah like yelling at each other like and i think there was like one where he's like writing in the book like look what i'm doing isn't it great how and, best and to solve like, the yes. world's problems than a global conspiracy involving mass murder right <laughs> right so they're very twisted characters and yeah. i i i just want to go back to who was this written for yeah i'm con- i'm convinced this was written in a way to appeal to a younger audience and that's why they even had this teen romance angle. Mm. Adding forced love interests to appeal to a wider audience is common. But in this case, it was interesting that they tried to weave it in with the storyline and including elements from the original source material. Misa Misa was way more of a tool of light 
than how oh, yeah. Mia was portrayed in the film, who's like for all intents and purposes, like right. You you said it, Patrick, the, uh, the or the dark side of light, but it could have been it, it, it could have been better. I feel like even knowing even knowing how it ended up being written and executed and characterized, I do actually think that this could have been pretty interesting. A secondary antagonist. If your character is someone that's reluctant, how do they achieve a tr- an arc of true villainy or anti anti hero? moving on from Mia and becoming more like light in the anime, truly accepting his sociopath mass murdering rampage. Right. Um, I think we're all waiting with bated breath for, which, which like maybe that could be interesting if that's who yeah. they write. Maybe. And maybe he's more calculated and strategic and he doesn't make the same mistakes again. Hmm. Maybe that's the interesting thing that we're looking for. Did we, did we close out reason number two, the characters, characters and the acting. acting? Yeah. I don't know what else there is to say. None of it feels inspired or anything like that no right i think we're i think we're good to move on to the next reason cool yeah Yeah. so number three for why this wasn't better the production does it work as a movie right so let's try to ignore what a poor adaptation of the source Mm. material this this is i I always try to do this mental exercise when i'm watching a movie like this that's that's Mm. adapting something quite famous like all right well maybe it doesn't work as an adaptation does it at least work as a movie I don't think it does here at all. I was trying to figure out, like, well, what does it do well? Outside of Willem Dafoe's performance, I don't think any of the acting's particularly convincing. I don't think it's paced well at all. Everything felt rushed to me, compressed into this 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's edited very well. There's a lot of things that don't add up. It feels it feels choppy. You can clearly tell there were scenes cut out. Yeah, There's some stilted dialogue. It's not particularly well written. And... I think the ending, it doesn't even try to really, I think, successfully even complete its own story, right? Like, you can't you can't even give it that credit, right? It leaves off very clearly, like, and there's more to come, kind of, right? It It's just, it, as a movie, like, you can't do that. Like, it's sort of like, it's just about damn near to ending it with a credits, like, a uh, line that is like, and their adventure will continue or something like that. Find out next week. Yeah, find out, exactly. <laughs> find out next week. Yeah, it doesn't earn it. And there's even, like, dumb continuity errors in it. There's one point, I think it's about halfway through, and Ryuk tells Light, he, he says, uh, I asked you to get rid of the note. But but he didn't. Mm-hmm. I actually went back and rewound the movie to look into this. He he never asks him to get rid of the note. In fact, he was doing the opposite. He was trying to talk him into using it in the first place. Now, I don't know if there's a cut scene where he mm-hmm. did ask him to get rid of it, mm-hmm. but or maybe it's just poor writing, but it's a pretty stupid error in the script. I have a feeling they weren't trying to, uh, in the editing, really ensure that there were a lack of continuity errors. <sighs> Like uh, like you said, right. like you said, Patrick, they were phoning it in, not just the acting, but on the editing floor as well. That's what it felt like. Yeah, the whole climax of this movie too is pretty absurd. There's a lot of slow motion. There's a lot of montages. Hmm. The thing that bugged me the most, I think, about the climax was L just randomly catching up to him when he's driving the police car. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense. Like, how did he know where Light was or where he was running to? I don't know that the writers actually watched Death Note when they wanted to adapt this. I'm not convinced of that. Hmm. Hmm. Well, yeah, they wouldn't want it to get in the way of the uh, of the uh, inspired, you know, work that was being done. No. Guys, how did how did you feel about the music choices that were inserted into this? I mean, generic and meant to appeal to a wide audience and kind of dumb. And how best to connect with a 2017 young adult audience and ending your movie mm. with an air supply cover of a Jennifer Rush song? Hmm. I will say that I wasn't sure if that was a weird sort of like nod. This is just a weird factoid that has been in my brain for probably 15 years because when i watched the 22 or the 2006 japanese one the credit song was red hot chili peppers danny california interesting and yep. i wasn't sure and that's a real thing and i wasn't sure if honestly when i watched the end of this movie i was like are they like 
making a reference to that like in the sense of like we're we're picking like a music thing that is just like is this really is this really the choice that we want to make for the end of the movie (laughs) can i interest you in a highly inappropriate pop song yes i did not know that i've never seen the japanese one that's interesting it was i remember seeing it at the time in a theater and i'm like oh is this just sort of like a weird localization choice they were like, "Oh, you know what? We'll just put a we'll put an American song for it was showing in American uh, theaters." But nope, it's the real it's the real ending song, which again totally fits the uh, the themes and style and characterization of Death Note. So they got that working at least. There's there's uh, something I noticed. So when Light uses the Notebook to take control of Watari, right? And he has mm-hmm. he basically has forty eight hours to live. He takes a train from Seattle to, to New York. Did you notice this? A train, an Amtrak. So I, I I googled this. You can actually take a train from Seattle to New York. It's it's about seventy hours. Um, so quite slow. Hmm. Just have him take a plane. Well, maybe he took the train to like a few hours out, then the plane or something like that. I don't know. Still not make sense. No, it still doesn't make any sense. And then th- maybe. Maybe one of you can fill me in on the ending, right? So L finds the page from the notebook, right? Mm-hmm. And it ends with it's implying that L is considering using the note to write Light's name in it, right? Yeah. That's what that's how I interpreted it. Sure, yeah. But as most people would, because he's like right. staring at a picture of light and being, you know, like staring right. at the page and like it's not a hard read. I think that might have been during the air supply song, maybe. But then I then I was thinking, how does how does L know how it works? He doesn't know about the notebook. How does he know that it's this supernatural piece of paper? I think because he's putting together that there were all these other names of people that died. I guess it's I, the hard the hard bit is yeah you can't it's very hard to separate that. You also have a character that again talk about characterization that is. Uh, like really liked again for a lack of sort for a cold calculatedness right and not an emotional reaction you know space that is you know like if it was the anime he would have sat down and explained over 12 minutes about how he hyper analyzed the situation and figured out that the only logical conclusion was that this notebook when you write someone's name on it it killed them or something like that perhaps and then my other thought so at the end he's in the hospital he wakes up and Light's father asks him, how did you do it, right? Mm-hmm. And he gives this long recap of events that 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 really fill us, the, the viewers, in, right? Yeah. But he doesn't really answer his father's question. He wanted to know how you, like, killed people. But he, Light tells him, like, the sequence of events that lead up to him being in a coma in the hospital. He, like, he, I think he, at one point, he refers to the death note in his, like, speech, but he doesn't explain it. So again, how would his father have any idea what he's talking about? Like the, the correct response would have been like, I used a supernatural notebook. Yeah. Yeah, you could even do a weird recap of everything. But it's clearly for us, the audience, not directed right. to what it was. Because so, we rushed telling the story of this movie, here's another montage. Yeah. I mean, again, they're kind of gesturing at a sort of like classic from the anime, like Light explains how this was his plan all along kind of thing. But it has none of the impact. It has none of the like gravitas of like, oh, the brilliant, the inspired brilliance of how you had the plot within the plot and how right. this was all exactly what he was going for. There's no right? big reveal. There's no, no. insight no... into the the maze that is this man's mind. It is right. literally just Never sad. mind that I feel they really, really copped out on you know, I don't want to, obviously you can contrast and compare. I'm okay with them maybe playing with the rules of the Death Note or something like that. But it was a really big cop-out that you can basically make things literally as specific as you want. I mean, like, to the point of like, oh, and then it will happen exactly like this in this way to make it, Mm -hmm. you know, burn my name from the page. And like, it's just like a little too now powerful. Like, it's almost... Anyway, not to say that the Death Note is an incredibly powerful thing as it's presented in the source material, but you did have to do some things to get around it at times. That's true. Any other uh, thoughts 
from either of you on the production does it work as an actual movie not this no. one and as we talked about i'll just reiterate from the beginning i think as you mentioned patrick like uh, the, a movie of this doesn't really work <laughs> right i mean mm. you need more time to or at least tease one these movie. things out well or or a longer movie or something <laughs> or something i mean i i, I agree like at least the way this one was done, it's not an easy task. I'm not of, I'm not going to say like it's impossible. I mean, Patrick mentioned Dune. I'm sure there are a lot of people for years that thought, oh, that's impossible to adapt. Hmm. And we saw a really good version of it. And yeah. so I don't want to just assume that it's impossible. And I want studios to still feel like that they can take these risks, even if these did not do so well. But it, uh, didn't look so hot looking at this film. No, and that brings us into our conclusion of this episode, which is the section where we we give our rating and, and you know state did we like it. So Nathan, as our guest, would you like to go first, last, second? Sure, I can go first. You know what? I brought this upon us. It's, Take it away. I can at least say. So, did I like this movie? No, I did not like this movie. I, I, for all the reasons we've talked about, I don't think really any part of this worked. And it's, it's, it's a weird thing because it's in some ways more disappointing than a lot of other things. Cause you, you want, you look at a lot of these ideas, right? A, there's, there is a potential here, right? As we all have acknowledged, Right. There's some something with this source material. There's something about the story that's told here that I don't see. I can look at other anime. I can look at other stories and be like, yeah, that might not work as well as a as a as a movie or at least adapted to an American audience. Right. But there's there's nothing. I mean, so much tells me this could work and to have something just missed so whiff so completely is just frustrating so there's certainly no recommendation and certainly you know i would rate this you know a big old thumbs down a to f scale a to f oh um uh this mm, yeah probably i'm gonna go it's hard for me to do such a superlative like exacting thing but uh yeah an f i don't see anything really valuable about this uh, Anton, I'll, I'll go first here. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is I understand that in any adaptation, things are going to have to be changed, right? You can't do everything one-to-one. -one. There is so much stuff in anime, in animation in general, but particularly anime that really only works when it's animated, right? And we, we kind of touched on this earlier is if when you're adapting something like this, how much of the anime-ness can you translate Hmm. to a live action format and what is the right balance and i i i don't envy the individuals that think about these things when they are trying to adapt this yeah. and, and and other anime right it's it's, it's got to be challenging especially the action stuff of it you can just do all different things with action in animation that you just can't do in live action mm -hmm. it'll, it'll look ridiculous right yeah so i understand that and what I would say to that is, if you're going to make fundamental changes from a very well-liked source material, do they serve any kind of an artistic or a thematic purpose? For this Death Note, I don't think any of the changes were justified. There's no improvement, really, from anything in the source material. There was no point during this movie where I thought, like, oh, well, that was really cool, or they really did that well, except for, I mean, Willem Dafoe is Ryuk, fine, good. I think he did a good voice performance, but... To me, this was just not even a serious attempt by Netflix. Yeah. This was a this was a very much a pump and dump project for them. They bought mm. it for cheap. They made it for cheap. They wanted to release it as quickly as possible. This had a very quick production too. I think when they started shooting to the release date, it was like less than a year. So that's mm. not a lot of time. But at the same time, I don't think this movie is a failure because it wasn't necessarily faithful to the source material, but it is a failure as a movie. It's one of the worst movies I've seen in the past 10 years, maybe, maybe hmm. more. The best part of this movie to me was the ending because it was over and I didn't have to watch it anymore. <laughs> the, the biggest indictment of this for me is if it wasn't called Death Note, there's no possibility that I even would have gotten 30 minutes into it. This is a very much 
a lot. It reminds me like a lot of the run of the mill Netflix original movies that I've seen. Only yeah. this one happened to butcher one of my favorite animes of all time. There's no possibility of me ever rewatching this. Uh, Nathan, I completely agree with you. And Anton, this is the first F rating that I am issuing on this podcast. Huge. This movie is abysmal. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you, yeah, you put it very well. There's, I don't envy trying to take on the difficulty of adapting like something, the anime-ness and having to do that interplay, but there's not even, I feel a real attempt here. Yeah. Yeah. So well said, well said, Patrick, and well said, Nathan. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just start by saying we started out with looking at examples where U.S. adaptations of anime succeeded. And we observe that there's such a long list of adaptations that don't do well. This, Of course, this film is on that list. And I just want to put it out there. It's hard. It is hard to meet those expectations when there's such a hype and love for the original source material and being able to adapt that faithfully, whatever that means, um, mm-hmm. is, is, is hard. It's difficult. And so I have to say that. But I do think and I do agree that this was not the most wholehearted attempt to really make a proper adaptation. And there are examples that we see of that. And my personal preference was for the characterizations of the anime, the characterization of the characters in the anime. Those characters made sense for the story and the story that ended up being told in the 2017 film was just not one that was riveting or one that really enticed me. And it's not even so much that it was a poor adaptation, but the fact that it was just a poor story being told. Mm. And I feel like that's just what's so disappointing. But having said that, I actually do really enjoy watching the film. Like not a lot, but like really? give it another year and I'll watch it and like laugh at it because there are, it's just cheesy. And so like, it's not in that level of so bad. It's good. No, but it, there is like a level of like, Oh God, this is so cringy, but uh, let's, I can laugh at this. And at the same time, there's a bit of a tinge of hope from my uh in on on my end that i hope that maybe this gets more streams maybe this gets more buzz we get a sequel we get we we maybe we do get something that is the more faithful or more successful adaptation we touched on it earlier there were two films that did really well edge of tomorrow and angel uh alita battle angel two examples where there was a more faithful source adaptation and one that really was more like a spiritual successor. I hope that whatever story they decide to tell, they just really think of how to tell a proper story, how to really build proper character development and just keep people excited because it's a, it's a great, it's, it's a great uh, just source material that is just a shame if they can't capitalize on it. So I give it an F plus. I know that's not a real grade, (laughs) It, like I think officially in the books, it's fine. There's an asterisk. I think there's an asterisk, and it says this is actually just an F. But I'm I I want to say F plus. So that's me for giving it such a horrific rating. You were fairly kind in your assessment here. Well, well I think that's more to the hope of it, right? The hope <laughs> of maybe someday we could see something. I share the same hope. I do not want Hollywood to stop trying to adapt anime. Yeah. Now you can always make the argument. Should most anime even be adapted? Is it fine as is? I don't know. Maybe, probably, but yeah, I hope they don't give up on it is my point. I agree. There's potential out there. There's potential even with this series. And hopefully they can learn some lessons <laughs> and uh, we can see something. Well, I know we were talking about this before we were recording. We, we try not to make our episodes longer than the movie but we may have done that here this yes. may actually be longer than death note uh that's i i like to think it's because we're having such a good time we're having a great time yeah uh nathan it has been an absolute pleasure oh the pleasure is all mine this has Uh-oh. been just a ton of fun guys thank you so much for this conversation and just um mm-hmm. yeah thank you so much for being here man really really appreciate it well that is it for this week's edition of why wasn't it better that's uh all we have to say about death note 
Anton, I think we mentioned this on the previous episode, but we already have next week's movie selected, and that movie is Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. Yep, we have another fun another fun episode for our listeners. So yeah. and then I think let's ready to you, set sail. Yeah, you may have did you pick a Bond movie for the one after I did. That? I did Spectre. Yep. That's right. We're gonna cover Spectre. Ugh. <laughs> ah, that's gonna be fun. But um we're gonna have to have you back. Yes, we oh. will. Absolutely. Hopefully we can find a better film than Death Note. <laughs> For the next or not, one. you know, as maybe that makes for better recording. About. Yeah, yeah, that is true. It is a lot of fun to talk about. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, that's it for this edition of uh, Why Wasn't It Better. We will see you next week when we talk about Pirates mm-hmm. of the Caribbean at World's End. Er.